AJ Styles' reputation up to 2016 speaks for itself. For a man that emerged during the early 2000s and never even stepped foot in a WWE ring, well, technically, he had an incredible career to boot. The face of TNA in the fans' eyes, of course, multiple-time world champion across multiple promotions including TNA, New Japan Pro Wrestling, and Ring of Honor. What makes Styles so good is the combination of skill he has. He can wrestle without the aerial moves, can wrestle a high-flying match, and if you had a disappointing match with AJ Styles, it would look bad on you. Up to 2013, he had a great run, but what elevated him was his incredible turnaround from an icon to a legend. AJ Styles was world class in TNA. At times, he could have been considered the best wrestler in the world, but after he grew his hair and started becoming the lone wolf, it was a new chapter in his career. A man whose peak few could reach in the industry still hadn't reached his own. The leader of Bullet Club following Prince Devitt's departure. The group rose to greater heights and many consider it to be the faction's best time. It was very cool and this man had everything at this point. The super push, the IWGP Heavyweight Championship and the collection of great matches with the likes of Shinsuke Nakamura, Roderick Strong, Kazuchika Okada and in no doubt about it surpasses and eclipses his TNA run. Because New Japan foresaw AJ Styles' worth. TNA had him capped at 91 overall and here this man was 96 overall and would be a great commodity for any company in the world. It would be a privilege for said company to obtain the services of AJ Styles. It was just up to said company to follow up and WWE was chosen. They gave him a low offer in 2014 and he turned it down opting to increase his stock and it certainly worked in his favor. And AJ was very close to joining TNA but family comes first and regardless of the push WWE would give him, there was no doubt about it financially correct. Initially they wanted to test him out, he was in this feud with Jericho that had some good matches out of it but the main story was would they trust him. Especially after the time where Miz scoffed and undermined his accolades outside of WWE. However, what won Styles in the eyes of Vince was his program with Roman Reigns. There was something special about Styles facing THE guy in WWE. It was a position nobody imagined and he knocked it out of the park. Styles' performance made Roman look better, perform better, and in turn allowed for him to feud with John Cena, but this time as a heel. And this is where he flew high. Styles showed that he could talk, had a different kind of aggression inside the ring and by July, he was the most interesting character in the WWE. This is a man who Vince said, I should have signed you 10 years ago. That's how successful Styles was and it was only 6 months into his run. Styles went on to beat John Cena at SummerSlam in an iconic match and I haven't watched it since then but I remember feeling satisfied at what I was seeing because this, this was a dream match, a dream match that actually turned out to be a reality and even the expectations that came with it were met. And with the super push that was flying towards the moon, there was only one thing left to do. The coveted WWE Championship. A title which nobody imagined would come near Styles, but not only did he challenge for it, but at this point he was basically the next champion. And after Dean Ambrose's bizarre interview with Stone Cold and the fact that Styles' momentum was red hot, his moment came sooner. After a comedy feud with Dean Ambrose about kicking another in the balls, both men had a strong match at Backlash, a match which brought the best out of both men. Styles managed to bounce back with a kick and hit the Styles Clash to win the WWE Championship. So now, the era of Styles had begun. Okay, with that said, on the September 13, 2016 episode of SmackDown, AJ Styles kicked off the show to address his title victory. Styles immediately bragged about his accomplishments, telling the fans, I told you so. Everything he said he would do, he did. He beat John Cena, now he's the face that runs the place. He beat Dan Ambrose, and now he's WWE World Champion. If he said he would beat them with one hand tied behind his back, <laughs> it's gospel. The sky is green if he says so, and he then called himself the champ that runs the camp. It fit AJ Styles' heel character so well, because as serious as he is, he's got some comedy behind him. And then John Cena interrupted. Now, for Cena, it was very simple. He wanted his armband back. This is no problem for AJ Styles, but it turns out Cena's talking about something else. He's like, I finally decided to take it back. Holding that title one more time means he's in the conversation with the man and Cena saw no bigger way to make history than beating AJ Styles to do it. you seen this smile back in 2006 to 2013, you know what was up here. Not so much. Dean Ambrose followed up and told Styles he made the biggest mistake of his life on Sunday. He had no problems losing matches normally but because of Styles' dirty win, he's become an enemy of his. He wanted his title back but Cena had a claim. He thought it was ironic that Dean's complaining when he dropped his jewels on the ropes two weeks earlier. Then proceeded to say Austin was right to call him out on his podcast in these last few weeks, he's just shown the fans that he has no balls. And for Dean, this was exactly what he wanted. He didn't give a damn about what John Cena says, and he called him a lazy part-timer and told him that he can't keep up anymore. WWE uses him as a corporate puppet, but regardless, he can't get it done anymore. Shane McMahon interrupted before things escalated. He had plenty of praise for these men, even AJ Styles who had to cheat to win. Then he booked him in a triple threat match against John Cena and Dean Ambrose for no mercy. As for tonight, they gotta team up. Styles, though, has to find a partner. In Styles' efforts to find a partner, he was largely unsuccessful. So he was ready to go out there alone, but Daniel Bryan found him a partner. The chinless wonder himself, James Ellsworth. James Ellsworth was so out of his element, and this image says it all. Like, look at this guy. This guy does not belong here at all. 
This guy was D. This guy was G League quality. And these guys were basically NBA All-Stars. That's what I compare it to. Because he was nothing. The Miz ended up making things right and getting rid of him. Miz ended up getting his ass beat though. And Cena and Ambrose's drama was certainly overshadowing everything else. With those two ready to settle their issues in the match, AJ Styles felt that he was superior to both men. There's no rivalry there with them. That's what he felt. He also held resentment over defending the title in a situation where he could lose without being pinned. Regardless though, the champion will always be here. These two had a solid match, but ultimately Cena came up short clean. From out of nowhere, AJ dropped Cena with a phenomenal forearm and connected with a Pele kick on Dean. Dan O'Brien was impressed, but then pulled his pants down saying that Dean Ambrose will get his one-on-one -on -one rematch next week. It's gonna be for the title. Ambrose rebounds with dirty deeds to show that he's got a chance. For Styles, this wasn't a huge problem. He bragged about beating up both Cena and Ambrose and all eyes were on him and he was intending to follow up. John Cena was providing commentary for this one and early on, Ambrose was very intense on the attack. He was full of fury and aggression which greatly benefited him. Ambrose slowed down and got technical because the match was asking for it. And Styles had no answer to this onslaught and it wasn't until after the commercial break that Styles had any semblance of offense. Ambrose's style was growing thin and AJ's more methodical efforts towards weakening the leg were getting him back into it. Both men were starting to go all out. Springboard 450, the elbow from the top and Ambrose was hurting. Then they got John Cena involved and this almost led to the title change but Cena's interference ruined everything for Ambrose and AJ retained. Ambrose's biggest mistake was provoking a fresh Cena. Styles too. These three men had one final confrontation the following week and this one was big. Ambrose called Styles a chump after a 15 year career. He's like, oh, you had all the respect and instead of climbing that last mountain, he takes the low road. Ambrose was more worried over having Styles being last week and it's all John Cena's fault. You should be thanking him for even having a chance at breaking that Ric Flair record. And there is John Cena. Just as he's about to talk, AJ shouts for him to shut up. I'm sure many felt that way about 2003 Triple H. And Styles knew what he was about to say. Cena's chased in history, I'm gonna become a 16 time champion and Styles thought it was deplorable that Cena would even compare himself to an icon like Ric Flair. No matter how many titles Cena wins, he'll never be in the conversation with Ric Flair. He shouldn't be worried about legacy, he should be worried about AJ Styles. Chasing history, I make history, that's what AJ Styles was saying. AJ was expecting Cena to make a fool out of himself like SummerSlam and when he wanted to rebound, Ambrose shut him up. Same thing, he knew what Cena was about to say and tell him to stop complaining and make him look like the jerk even though he got screwed over twice. He's like, oh, this is a political skill. That's what John Cena is good at. That's how Cena's been relevant for 15 years. Ambrose believed Cena wanted to do the same to him. He's like, oh, I work hard. You go to award shows and think you work hard. Nope, I wrestle all the shows, zero days off. Most matches out of any wrestler last year and the year before that. Ambrose knew Cena had zero respect for him. Why? Because he doesn't play his game and he won't start. If being fake is what it takes to be a superstar in his eyes, he doesn't want none. Then he told him to have fun playing John Cena on TV. Fine speech wasn't to be, instead Cena said, Talk is cheap and went on the attack. Did Cena make good on this? Well, kind of. Styles followed up before Ambrose hit Dirty D's to pose with the title on top. Okay, okay. Strong build. They actually did something different with Cena. He was portrayed as a potential villain by Ambrose and AJ. Ambrose especially managed to construct a whole new viewing point towards Cena. And when I mean new, I mean new in WWE because this stuff's been said about him on the internet and outside of the ring. AJ Styles had every right to be in this feud. He belonged and then some, which is crazy if you look only a year back. He would have belonged a year ago. You know, a year back for sure he would have belonged, but the perception in WWE was a bit different about him. The three men started off No Mercy because of the presidential debate. Great poem for the match with that No Mercy song, and they should just bring back the event just to play that song. But about the match, let's talk about it. Great stuff. There's never a dull moment because number one, 2016 AJ Styles is in there, and two, the triple threat concept. The results seemed out of question, but they still made it entertaining enough. They had a similar spot to none of Champions 2009 with Styles tapping out and the match was restarted. The champion had to adapt to the situation to steal the win and retain the title and that's how it was. It was good. I, I liked this match. I watched it again for the video. It was enjoyable. The reason why I didn't go about it in details because it's more complicated to give a quick overview of triple threat matches. Those are better suited for the full overview that I usually do on the pay-per-view reviews but that's not the point. Okay, with that said, later that week on SmackDown, Styles came out and proclaimed himself to be a champ. In his eyes, being Cena and Ambrose, that's not great. That's phenomenal. The man proceeded to call the fans a bunch of losers that live vicariously through him and even then there's only room for one on this bandwagon and told him to cheer for Cena. Then he's like, oh wait, he's not around. So he asked him to cheer for Ambrose who's actually a lunatic loser. There's no point. About No Mercy is like, oh, it doesn't matter how I win. The point is, I beat John Cena and Dean Ambrose. He repeated this like three times. Unlike others, he wouldn't take a night off after such a tremendous victory. So AJ Styles wanted to give a man of main event status an opportunity. And Dean Ambrose interrupted. He knew very well that Styles wasn't talking about him because he's all about the easy win. 
His reasoning for the excuse is because he had to take that opportunity. Ambrose refused to budge. He knew that it was going to come down to them and refused to allow anyone to take his title shot. Styles was like, this man isn't even on the roster and James Ellsworth came out. The level of shame on Dean's face, you'd think this was him in 2018. And the reason why Styles chose him was because he was robbed of his opportunity last month by The Miz. It was a non-title match, of course. As much as it irritated Ambrose, he wanted to see this front row. Now, this is what AJ didn't want to hear. He didn't want to hear this. He wanted him to hop off. But Dan O'Brien, though, saw it differently. The decision seemed like it wouldn't go down, but Brian granted the match and made it a fit. However, Dean Ambrose was going to be the special referee for this one. Of course, AJ couldn't touch him. Ambrose's officiating was straight out of NB, and this match was very one-sided in terms of officiating. Like, we just gotta say. The referee was bringing back rules from pre-2008 WWE, such as closed fists being banned. And it was some goofy stuff that hadn't been seen in the main event scene, since ironically, Ambrose and Rollins' is feud from 2015. The champion wrapped things up at the worst time because Ambrose was taking a phone call. Bro was doing everything but officiate, and I was about to say, I'm shocked he hasn't eaten, but he proved me wrong. Styles had the match won, but Ambrose dropped him with dirty deeds. They followed up with another one and did a fast pit. The champion tried complaining about this, but Shane told him that he's to blame. Then they revealed that Ellsworth gets the title shot next week. Styles said that if Ellsworth were to win the title, it would be catastrophic and compared it to David Arquette winning the WCW title. Ambrose was sitting front row for this match and he announced both men. He was causing a disturbance inside and outside the ring for AJ Styles and it was all about distracting the champion. Ambrose was basically making a YouTube video called trying to piss off AJ Styles he hit me. Ellsworth had a huge moment to win with the sweet chin music and the fans wanted it, Ambrose wanted it, but Styles got himself disqualified. Not out of fear, but because he was so angry and wanted to lash out, get aggressive with him. He was announced as a loser and Dean hit dirty deeds before calling Ellsworth the winner. So the night of anger and frustration concluded with Styles on his back and Ellsworth as the victor. Ambrose's title shot wasn't going to be granted like that, however, as he had to fight for it and he had to face the phenomenal one in the main event. Ellsworth was by his side and Styles, of course, wasn't fond of his company. And vice versa. This led to the lunatic fringe getting disqualified and even then, James Ellsworth managed to find a way to get Ambrose a rematch. But unfortunately for him, he wasn't able to stand by his side in the main event. That didn't matter though because he ran in near the end and Styles tackled him like he booked his 2012 run in TNA. This distraction was enough for the dirty deeds and Dean Ambrose finally got that title shot he was desperately looking for. The title match was to go down at TLC. With Survivor Series on the horizon, these two were forced to coexist. Styles called James Ellsworth a mew and turtle and threatened to beat both of them up. He had plenty of hatred for Dean Ambrose, but his main focus at this point was to beat Team Raw. Baron Corbin took issue with Styles calling it his team and the Wyatt family followed up before Dean Ambrose came out and brought the team mascot, James Ellsworth. Now this is where the champion had a problem. This is where he had a problem. He didn't care where Ambrose stored him, he just wanted him out of here. Corbin walked out because he didn't care about any of this and then Shane McMahon booked the main event tag team match involving those in the ring. He settled things down and tried to convince them to focus in favor of Team SmackDown, and at one point they literally brought back Edge to host the Cutting Edge so he could cut through these problems ahead of Survivor Series. Why him? There's few that identified with the blue brand like the Rated R Superstar. Even The Undertaker had to come out to support these guys. The Survivor Series elimination match caused the perfect storm of chaos. These problems that AJ and Ambrose had boiled over in a huge way. Now the match itself needs no introduction, it was tremendous, the whole thing was excellent, sure I haven't watched it since but I remember thinking it was one of the best matches of the year. Ambrose hated AJ so much that he sided with his old Shield brothers and took him out. It was the first real Shield reunion since 2014 and Shane McMahon was seething because this almost cost Team Smackdown the match. They won it, but Ambrose was going to pay the price. As for Ellsworth, he got the chance to do something huge, a contract. He was going to get the chance to win a WWE, a SmackDown contract. Even then, Styles was offended because to him, this guy deserved nothing. So he told him to fight for it in a ladder match. This man earned a contract in the end for getting his ass beat, but still wanted to put it on the line. Even told AJ that if he wins, he gets a title shot. To Styles, this was nothing more than a tune-up for his TLC match. It was all set up for him to drop the chinless wonder and move on, but Dean Ambrose was a hater and cost him once again to give James Ellsworth a SmackDown contract. The following week, AJ and Ambrose had one final confrontation ahead of TLC. The champion was more worried about Ellsworth and Dean had to remind him of what's ahead. The most dangerous match in WWE. So instead of responding, he shoved them and inflicted damage on Ellsworth who took a Styles Clash on the floor. AJ was pissing off everyone in sight. He made fun of the tag team champions, belittled them, and then Ambrose comes in, leading to a brawl. So they ended strong. The build was somewhat hurt by the Survivor Series stuff. They took the comedy route for the most part, but turned it up in the final episode. It's what you would expect from a feud involving these two in 2016. It would be different today, of course. And even then, they still had an intense hatred for each other during this feud. Okay, about this one, it was a nice way to cap off AJ's incredible year on pay-per-view. Every match, this man would come in with a mission. He was wrestling like rent was due. Ambrose played his part, no doubt about it but the real superstar like every single match in the last 12 months was the phenomenal AJ Styles. He had his ways at this point. 
Anything he touches, it was magic. This man was 2016 LeBron, and he was doing it with ripped pants. Like, his ass was out, but it didn't matter. The match came down to James Ellsworth costing Ambrose the match, taking yet another L like his last name, Ellsworth. And this mostly had to do with him thinking he had a chance of winning the title against Styles. That's why he cost him the match in storyline. For Ambrose, it was yet another shortcoming, and I remember at the time, there were a lot of memes, a lot of jokes about how this guy was losing all the time. The man was starting to lose a lot like Dolph Ziggler. And this match had some short-term effects for the phenomenal AJ Styles, as he suffered a minor foot injury, but it wasn't a big deal, you know? It wasn't even the main topic of a discussion during his promo later that week on SmackDown. Ellsworth thought this was Styles being scared of defending his title, but the champion reminded him that Dean Ambrose was the one that was giving him the wins. His problem with him was over. He beat him. Now James has to deal with this, and that's a lesson he learned almost immediately as Ambrose hit dirty deeds a couple of seconds later. This led to Ellsworth being unable to compete and challenge for the title, so a replacement was determined in a fatal four-way match. Since Dolph Ziggler was the living embodiment of TNA wrestling, you know, he goes down, fights back, so just basically a survivor, you know? He's not doing well, but he finds a way to survive. He found a way to beat Ambrose in Miz to become number one contender. That match is going to go down to the final episode of SmackDown, but first, AJ Styles had to face James Ellsworth for the title. This was academic. Like, we don't gotta say. AJ even did him a favor and gave him a beating so bad that he disappeared from the main event scene. This man almost turned face for whooping another man's ass. He said that it was finally time to move on to more important things for next year. His mind was ready in 2017 because he's got everything done. He doesn't need to ask Santa for anything. Dolph Ziggler reminded him that he's next up for the title, but AJ's like, oh, I forgot about you, why? Because it's a cakewalk and straight up called AJ a loser. Dolph thought it was ironic because it took four tries for AJ to beat James Ellsworth. Then the show started giving his life story about how he's willing to do anything to get that title, and this man of this era was willing to do anything but win. He died destroying himself, and almost every time it mattered most, this guy would lose. Baron Corman didn't want to see yet another Ziggler match because one, he's going to lose, and number two, he's taken up all the opportunities, and instead he wanted himself. Dolph told him that he earned it unlike him who was walking on the red carpet. Corbin told him the only reason why he earned anything was because he wasn't around. So it was basically leading to a match between the two. And he assaulted him. Styles, like his theme song says, didn't want none. And Ziggler's demand of facing Barry Corbin came out of price. He had to put up his title shot. Styles got involved with the match after they provoked him. And Dan O'Brien decided to make it a triple threat match for the title. For Corbin, this was the biggest night of his career up to this point. For Dolph, this was a night that didn't come often. And for AJ, a normal day. The thing I love most about AJ Styles is in, in 2016 is... This man was the legitimate definition of big match player. He always showed up when it didn't matter, or in this case, it did. The match itself was a tremendous representation of SmackDown from 2016 and 17. Pure vibes, they laid it all out there, and everyone looked cool one way or another. This spot needs no mention. The end of days always looked good, but in this situation, it's on another level. And the result was obvious, but it didn't hurt the match in the slice. And after it was waiting, the returning John Cena. This man didn't even wait for his entrance music. He came out to offer a handshake because he wanted this title shot. The champion instead preferred to lay his title and finally follow through. So the match was confirmed for the Royal Rumble. John Cena's journey of cementing his legacy as an all-time talent by winning the title for the 16th time. Against AJ Styles cementing the fact that he's better than the face that runs the place. The following week was the contract signing. Styles didn't understand why Brian was doing this. It was unnecessary because himself and Brian were cut from the same cloth. They wrestled in front of nobody. And then there's this guy who goes and disappears for three months. He's on TV shows and that gets him a title shot. The GM felt that this had to happen because they need to keep the momentum going. He also told me, hey, you shouldn't be worried, you beat John Cena three times. And he left him to be. Styles called Cena the luckiest guy in the world because he got a title shot from his brother-in-law. Ness said he agrees, they have to do what's best for SmackDown and AJ Styles. He wanted to return the favor telling Cena that if he doesn't get a win, he doesn't belong in WWE. Then Cena said that he respects him and AJ shuts him down. He's like, don't do that. And similar to Rock, who Cena called a phony, AJ decided to reciprocate that same sentiment towards him. AJ made sure to specifically call him a husband and even said that in Hollywood, he'll never be as good as The Rock. In ring, he'll never be as good as AJ Styles. And with zero doubt in his mind, he signed the contract. All's good, but John Cena has even spoken. He said AJ's made the biggest mistake of his life pissing him off. And yes, he needs a win to prove that he still hasn't left. And he said that he's lost all respect for AJ and called him a punk little bitch. Cena went to detail about passion. Every night AJ Styles walks down the ramp because he has to. He walks down because he wants to. That's the difference between them. They're not the same. Always talking about Hollywood. Anyone in this place would have already left, but he's still here. This guy at his peak was diabolical. He gives the heel hope, the fans of that person hope, then pulls their pants down. That's how John Cena was. Cena knew that AJ was going to bring his A game, but even then, he's still going to kick his ass and take his title. Why? Because he's John Cena. Baron Corbin came out and ruined everything, though, but it was an excellent promo. AJ Styles was a standout. He managed to turn things around and portray John Cena as a selfish villain who walked out of the fans despite endlessly holding Rock accountable for his departure. 
Archer. In addition, also used Cena's status in connection with Daniel Bryan as the reason for his title shot, showing that it's not based on the merit of former wins, rather the status of said individual. John Cena, on the other hand, emphatically shut down all of these accusations the way he could, and also flipped things over, accusing AJ of being here for the money instead of personal interest, like himself, who he admits has been busy. To him, the match wasn't entirely about the championship. Sure it was, but Cena craved the situation, a situation where he would fight AJ Styles at his best for the title he won 15 times, and if he won, his legend status is elevated to the greatest heights that only one man, THE man, reached. Doing so would show that he still had it in him, the only answer that he would accept from the situation. Great segment. They did interact with each other the following week with Cena dropping Styles with the AA, but their next segment was even crazier. As good as their segment together was two weeks earlier, this is the one people think about. AJ started off the promo complaining about being overshadowed in the Royal Rumble poster despite being champion. Then he proceeded to call out John Cena, refusing to waste time. The crowd was insanely divided. Let's go Cena, Cena sucks. And just as he's about to talk, Styles shuts him up, saying he had enough. What irritated Styles was the confidence and arrogance from Cena, who refused to acknowledge this guy. He's obviously referring to AJ Styles. He just called him a guy from Atlanta. Styles was fuming over this and even said that nobody missed Cena. Why? Because he replaced him and that gets him surely. He's not the guy anymore. Styles started talking about excuses before calling Cena the final excuse. Why? Because he's a sorry excuse of a wrestler. And again, Styles' frustration came out to not being respected enough. He ain't settling for an inch at the Royal Rumble. He's settling for a foot in his ass. Okay? And Cena finally responds. He belittled AJ's complaints and compared them to his problems, which he ignores, and talked about how if AJ fails, he's gonna blame it on Cena for burying him. Talking about respect, he's like, oh, you've been hot for six months while well, I locked this place down for a decade. Oh, I didn't wrestle on the indies. Well, I was built for WWE and the big moments like right now. Regardless of how good AJ thinks he is, he's not on this level, not even on the level below him. He's like, oh, I get done in a day what you can't in a career. You're upset about a poster? Photoshop yourself. I care about Sunday and about the guy from Atlanta. You're not that guy. You're not that. You're just just a guy. A guy that holds this championship because I let you. He went on to call AJ Styles an unoriginal person. A guy that hates everything about him, yet tries to emulate him and he mentions the face that runs the place nickname, which was Cena's. Cena follows up saying, quote, there's only one John Cena and I'm still a bad, bad man and my time is now. Recognize. Now nah, this was he. I remember it hit even harder in 2017. So I finished the promo and forgot what Styles said because of how dominant and unforgiving Cena was here. He of course could look good because he's John Cena and he has that freedom. In Styles' case being unacknowledged for him because he put in a lot of work to get to this point in Excel, his performances still aren't enough to warrant being called his name or feature on the front of the poster, and AJ in particular had a strong performance last time around. I assume he didn't have the freedom to do it here because he's a heel, so he obviously can't look better than the babyface, but Cena cut through him like a hot knife and butter. It was rough. Cena and Let Loose is like a rabid dog. The man won't let go until he gets the bite. There was an incredible atmosphere in the Alamo Dome. These guys had everything set up for something that could potentially be legendary. Early on, AJ's intensity overpowered Cena. His advantage was that he was wrestling often, and Cena had some shots in, but this was all AJ Styles. John Cena, though, was John Cena, and in the most John Cena moment you'll ever see, this man rebounded with an AA. It wasn't enough to win it, but he was in a position to build momentum, which he failed to follow through with because AJ hit the phenomenal forearm. From here, the match kicked into high gear. Calf Crusher, STF, even AJ Styles locked in the STF, and they tried to build some doubt Styles hitting the Styles Clash, and it was possible because Cena wasn't the same man, but he kicked out. John Cena pulled out a code red like he was used to doing it, and the man even hit the Avalanche AA, and everyone thought it was over. AJ Styles, though, was like, no, it's not. He said it's not over. At this point, it felt like any finisher was the last one, but Cena grabbed him, hit an AA, and another one to go for the cover. One, two, three, new champion. 16 time champion John Cena. I can't overstate how incredible this match was. I remember back in 2017 feeling like I was watching wrestling history and since then only few matches can actually say they were better than this in WWE. I don't even know if there's actually a match that could say it was better than this. It had the atmosphere, the story and of course the action followed up. These two perfected their matches a long, long time ago and shared a connection that few could in the squared circle. It's insane to me because we always thought Edge, to a lesser extent Randy Orton and CM Punk were Cena's best opponents, but after this, AJ Styles was another inclusion. For me, it just has to be a 5-star match, and that ain't a throwaway rating for the sake of it. These guys performed at the highest level without a single moment outside the ring. What impresses me most is that this match came almost one year to the day that AJ Styles debuted in WWE. His run was magical, and I don't think we'll see something like it in the future. To excel at the highest level with the boss downing you and not only winning him over, but becoming one of the most trusted wrestlers he could go to, it's incredible. AJ's success in the past year proved that he was still world class and was operating at a level few wish they could achieve. I haven't felt this way about a debuting wrestler since then. AJ's on another level due to the consistency, the way he was booked, the matches themselves were at the very highest level, and we were witnessing history and we knew it at the time. It's not like we're looking back in hindsight. 
Like, I'm looking at my old posts from 2016, and I was raving about AJ Styles. What a way to complete his first year. What a way to end his title reign. Giving it back to the face that runs the place in my match of the year for WWE. It can't get any better unless the match actually happened at WrestleMania. And there was a lot of rumors at the time of Styles facing Undertaker at WrestleMania, but they decided to end it here. Alright, that's AJ Styles' title reign. Incredible. This guy had a comedy storyline. He had an intense feud with Dean Ambrose at the same time he was pissing off John Cena. Everything was going well. Like At this point, anything AJ Styles touched was going to succeed, and that's what happened here. Everything about this run was amazing. This guy could have held it for a year and nobody would have had a problem. You know what I mean? Like, this AJ Styles in 2016 was insane. I'm not over-exaggerating. I'm not overrating him the slightest. If you watched at the time and you appreciated him, you know what I'm talking about. His promos were at... At his very best. He was talking like he never talked before. Was wrestling insane for a wrestler in WWE with the springboard 450 splashes. All of that. His moveset was insane. The way he constructed the matches. His charisma. Everything about him was on point. And as I said, it was a nice way to wrap up his first year in WWE. It was incredible. My favorite promo of his was his promo with John Cena and the contract signing from three weeks earlier. He had some great promos before the title reign, of course, with the headband on his head, but we're talking about the title reign here. The best match was Royal Rumble 2017, it just has to be. I enjoyed that match, I'm sure a bunch of you would enjoy that as well, and I have it as my match of the year for WWE in 2017 because of how good it was. So yeah. Alright, what do you guys think of AJ Styles' title reign? Please comment down below, and that's the first video. Make sure you hit the Styles question on the like button, and perhaps the phenomenal forum on the subscribe button. Peace, I'm out.